Mm. He never slumbers. All right. So welcome once again back to Wednesday Night Bible Study. This is going to be our last night in the book of James, if you will. Um, Five chapters, five short chapters, but very much practical living for Christians, uh, uh, applicable to every every part of our life, even in this day and age. Tonight I've... um, We're going to be in chapter 5. We're going to wrap it up. Verses 7 to uh, the last one there, 20. We've named tonight's lesson the four PSs. You know the postscript, like, P.S., I love you. So four PSs from James. Tonight's lesson, we're going to review the six ways that Christians are different, and then we'll discuss James' final words of encouragement to, the, to his readers. But first, let's, let's have a word of prayer before we begin. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for an opportunity once again to dig into your word. I thank you for the things that you've shown us in James Um, Let us learn more tonight, Father God, and review the things that we've learned, and and more importantly, apply them to our lives. Thank you for everything. Give you the credit for glory, and glory for everything. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So tonight I want to review what we've been covering so far in the book of James, in case anybody's missed a lesson here and there. Um, Plus it'll just kind of, we'll we'll pick up on those key points that we've learned along the way. And if you you didn't take maybe good notes the first time, if you're a note taker, you can can jot some stuff down. And then we're going to look at the last verses uh, of chapter 5 where James leaves his readers kind of with some information they need to remember after they finish reading his book. But first let's go ahead and start our review. Now if you remember when we began the book of James, uh, we were talking about the theme of the letter and the Jews that James is speaking to, uh, are the ones that he's writing to in his book, they're discouraged. They're discouraged for, for being alienated um, from their own countrymen, if you will, their, their culture. They're in a whole different place. Um, the surroundings, there's a lot of uh, Greek influence, a lot of uh, art, and all those things we, we discussed in the beginning. So uh, they were in a, a completely strange place, if you can imagine. Some of the things they were suffering, um, as a Jewish culture, they were isolated, again, because of some of their customs and practices, uh, which made them very, very much different from the Gentile community that they were surrounded by. Uh, They were, again, dispersed from their homeland for a variety of reasons. We know, of course, there's persecution, so on and so forth, but they were also um, traders and businessmen, so they, they were kind of dispersing themselves, if you will. And they would set up different, in different cities throughout the Roman Empire, and they would obviously establish their synagogue, their house of prayer, where they would gather. So they had like these small little communities uh, throughout the Roman Empire, and they were, but all alone to themselves, if you will. This reminded me a lot of the circus industry when I was in it. Uh, I always mentioned that. We'd get interviews in the morning with the different uh, local news affiliates and what have you. They'd come in and start interviewing me. Most of our performers were Latin or uh, Romanian or Russian or whatever, so they didn't speak a lot of English, and I would kind of walk us through the interview. And that was often the way I would describe us, as kind of a small little village of people, if you will, traversing in a whole great big world all alone to ourselves. Now, imagine the Jews, they're already minorities in a uh, majority Gentile pagan area, and then some of the Jews started becoming Christians. Uh, so now they're a minority within a minority, if you remember. And that was the problem. They were starting to feel the pressure. Uh, as Christians, they were not only isolated because of the Gentile surroundings that we just spoke about, but they were alienated because they had a moral code and uh, spiritual aspirations that were way greater and more noble than anybody that they were, they were around, any of the pagans for sure. Um, and their conversion to Christianity put them at odds also with their, their Jewish brethren. You know, they were, uh, they were isolated times too, you know. Many of them even began, uh, began learning, rather, that, that 
this, this Christianity wasn't like a, a doctrinal adjustment, if you will, or it wasn't like an appendage added to Judaism by no means. In fact, they were, they were very much learning that it wasn't uh, anything like that at all. It was far greater, and it was completely different, and it represented a radical change in, uh, in a person's attitude and the activity that they, they conducted uh, in their life, in and around their life, if you will. Um, and James says, you know, a change was necessary if they were going to survive. Uh, if they were going to survive the persecution, the isolation. Um, and now, the, again, the Jews are living amongst Gentiles. And, and imagine they have memories of Jerusalem. They have m- memories of their hometown, their, uh, the holiday feasts. The, uh, the holiday, excuse me, the feast, the magnificent temple. Uh, the priest and their priestly vestments, their, their robes, their garments. Uh, the parades, the worship, the sacrifice, all that, all that uh, pomp and ceremony stuff that kind of went along with the Jewish religion. Now they're, they're Christians. They're in a completely foreign place. They're meeting in homes. Uh, m- the most elaborate ceremony that they have, from what I'm learning, it was the breaking of bread, the sharing of the cup. It was, it was the only ceremony, really. Again, they, there were no... No priests dressed up. There was, there was no pomp. There were no parades. None of that stuff going on. So now they're feeling completely isolated, you know? Not only that, but they're starting to think, uh, man, I'm kind of homesick. You know, this new religion's not at all. I mean, we were, we were bound by so much. We had to do so many things. We had to offer this. We had to go and do that. We had to pray so many, face this, you know, all these kind of different things. It's, it was, to them, it was an odd place to be. You know, I can, I can imagine maybe some of them were thinking uh, of going back to Judaism. Maybe some of them were thinking about possibly letting go of their Christian faith. So James is writing to those kind of people. That's who we're talking about. Uh, if we were to summarize the book of James, or if I were to, I, I'd say it's six ways that Christians are different, or it's six ways that have changed in a person's life to reflect their sincerity of their faith, if you will. It's, it's a, an outward change that can be seen. And James is saying in order to, to survive in a world full of disbelief and persecution, you're going to have to change. You're going to have to walk that walk. If there's no change, there's no survival. 2,000 years has gone by, and it's still the same for us now. If we don't change as Christians and try to walk as Christians, uh, we're not going to survive. We'll survive as something, but it won't be a Christian. So let's uh, go over six ways Christians are different according to James. Number one, they rejoice in trials. Now, I've, I've included the scripture. If you want to jot that down and go back later on and chew on it, that's absolutely a wonderful idea. Uh, but we won't have time to go through and read. We'd have to read the whole, the whole book of James again this evening. So again, I put that up there for you. So Christians rejoice when there's problems, uh, knowing that perseverance through the trials is going to help them to grow spiritually. Um, you know, people in the world, they give up. They get angry. Um, they get depressed at adversity. Uh, Christians, on the other hand, we respond to trials with joy. I was just having this conversation. Harley came. She calls. She goes, Papa, she goes, I need a word. I, I feel defeated. And she was out working. The way her pay is, she's part salary, part, part tipped employee when she's delivering on certain days. And she's worked all afternoon, delivered 13 orders, and received $5 in gratuity. And was taking it kind of personal and, and what have you. And uh, really emotional over it. And I was like, baby girl, you, you, first of all, don't take ownership of anybody's lack of or generosity for that matter. That's not for you to have to deal with. Um, you can't do anything about that. But she went on to talk about a few other things. I was like, listen, you one of the things I'm studying in the book, James, right now, if you come, you can hear all about it, is when we are going through trials, that's when we need to realize, and we do as Christians, that that's when God's closest to us. That's when he's working on us. I was trying to share that with her. I, I think of it like this, as a work zone. When I worked down in Sarasota, I was equipment operator, and I was loading dump trucks on the Legacy Trail. They picked up 12 miles of train track that used to run for the circus train through the town, and they've made it a biking path, exercise place to be. And we would put these cones out. They'd have caution tape and what have you. And, and th- what's that there for? To let you know, hey, work area. Men working. Stay back. Men and women working. Stay back. You know, go a different way. Detour. All those kind of, all those kind of things. 
Well, think of it the same way with Jesus. Think of it as him putting cones and, and caution tape around you in your life. You know, he's at work in your life. Yeah, it's messy. There's holes, there's detours, there's, there's inconvenience. All those things that come when you come. We went up to Brandon Hospital, Pastor Arlen's like, he goes, be careful, man. It, it looks completely different. They've got it all walled up, and he ended up having to walk all the way across to the other side. It, it, it is. It's a mess. There's a lot of inconvenience around it. And that's what James is talking about. You know, the Lord's working us on us, is what I'm saying. If you imagine it like that, imagine he's working on you. He's helping you grow. You know, the work will be finished at some point and, and better when it's done. But for now, we've got to hang in. We've got we to persevere. So this first way that a Christian is different is they rejoice when there are problems because they know Christ is working on their lives. The second way that Christians are different, they respond to temptation with action. Uh, They take action against sin. They don't succumb to it. They don't make excuses for it. You know, godly people, us, we expect temptation. We expect trials in those parts of our life. Uh, And we deal with it through prayer, through self-control, knowledge in God's Word, the the stuff we're talking about here this evening. You know, we we don't rationalize uh, unrighteous behavior. I did this for a long time. I, again, I like to be completely transparent and honest. Absolutely, the way I was living my life was, uh, and the people that I was hanging out with, it was all par for the course, you know. We put so much work into rationalizing our sin or minimizing it, and, and instead of just admitting, hey, this is a problem in your life, dude. Get a grip. Ask for some help. Be honest with yourself. You know, Anybody like movies here? You like movies? I'm not going to recommend you see this movie, but it made me think of it. Um, in my former life, watched uh, a movie, uh, Ocean's Eleven. It's a movie about this uh, elaborate heist, if you will, that these friends that are, that are thieves are going to try to pull off against the casino owner. And the big deal is it's 160 mil that's on the line. $160 million could go a long way especially when you're buying fuel. <clears throat> now, in that movie, the team was clever to think about everything, every little detail, every little ingenious thing that they could do to foil the security system, to break into the safe, arrange not one, maybe two, three getaway cars, getaway drivers. They wanted to evade capture, possibly even getting shot. I mean, you start robbing from the wrong kind of people, they're not calling the cops, if you know what I mean. So uh, they had every intricate detail down. Every finite calculation. And that's what the whole movie was about. And those heist movies are like that. Sometimes they get away with it. Sometimes they don't get away with it. But it got me thinking. If these guys would spend that much time, that much money, effort, energy, everything that they had, and do something legitimate and legal, they'd be successful. I was like, man, I... I, I humbled myself this afternoon when I thought, and same way, it's the same way it is with us as Christians. You know, a lot of times, and again, I I call myself out. I put too much energy in in that kind of stuff. If we put that kind of energy into dealing with temptation, we'd have way more success. The third thing, Christians both hear and do the Word. Do what it says. Do what the Word teaches. You know, I'm learning most of the New Testament, um, <clears throat> most of the New Testament focuses on explaining, explaining what Christians believe. As I re- read James and studied it over the last nine weeks, um, James kind of zeroes in on what Christians ought to do to show that they believe uh, and to have that Christian life. It's, it's very short on doctrine, if you will, but very long on, you know, the walk. Um, and it's all about the walk, not just the talk. The fourth thing, Christians aren't prejudiced. <clears throat> Unlike the world around us, um, you know, we, we, we're exclusive to matters of the faith, but we're inclusive when it comes to love. We love everybody. That's the way it should be. Uh, you know, I don't accept everything that somebody else believes, at least not until I vetted it and, and, and checked it with God's Word. It's the ultimate authority, really. Um, but as a Christian, us as Christians, 
we should, ex- we should accept and love everyone, regardless of their belief, their color, social, demographic, whatever it is. The world doesn't see it that way. Uh, oftentimes, uh, they consider us narrow-minded, bigoted, racist. I, I start to deal with some of that now in, in my short time up here on the pulpit. It, they assume that because we question someone else's belief or their philosophy or their religion, um, that we're somehow not being accepting or, or these, like I said, these racist things, uh, bigoted, narrow-minded. Uh, it's just we're not afraid to say, hey, look, I don't believe. I don't believe that the religion that you're talking about is legitimate. I, I believe there's a hole in what you're talking about based on what I believe. You know, there's some sort of fallacy with your philosophy uh, based on what the Bible says. You know, we're allowed to be thinking people, critical thinkers of things, you know, uh, test the philosophy, the religion of other people and compare it to God's word. There's nothing wrong with us doing that. The thing we have to remember, though, is uh, we have to be cautious and, and remember to continue to love people even if they err in the way that we see God's word. As believers, we believe Christians are saved, but Christians themselves ought to love everyone regardless, again, like I said, of their social, cultural, and religious backgrounds. I, you know, with the religion of Islam, it's, it's hard not to end up here. We don't, we're not going to talk about the, the Baptists. Uh, we're not going to talk about Methodists. We're, we're, we're going to talk about the religion of Islam for a moment and the terrorism and the sympathizers that kind of go along with that, supporting that kind of stuff all around the world. You know, it's, it's everywhere. We have conversations at the back of the church. Um, it's in our headlines. It's on every device we have. Uh, we, we share emails about things that are going on. It's in editorial comments. And, and the real question is, how do we win over somebody from that kind of a faith? You know, I know there's a military component to it. Trust me, I, I, fully, I fully get that part of it. But the, the, eventually, the, the final victory has to be through Christ. It has to be about love. You know, I heard a speaker when I was studying for this evening say something that I thought was interesting. Uh, apropos, on point, whatever you want to call it. He said that Islam is a philosophy masquerading as a religion. And I believe that absolutely. But as far as we're concerned, as believers, you know, if you've got a Muslim neighbor, uh, if you want to win them over, we've got to out-love them. You know, we don't have to accept what they believe. You know, sometimes we call Muslims on the idea that, that they have of their religion as far as the religion of peace. I know when I was in the Marine Corps, I had a few conversations with uh, some other jarheads and some sailors that were there. And uh, we'd be in the weight room talking about stuff, and they were always trying to convince me that it was a religion of peace. And I'm like, you know you're telling me this as we make a transatlantic trip to Saudi Arabia, Right? <laughs> to go get in a fight with, you know, people that are doing dastardly deeds and what have you. You know, and it's the same thing. It's, we're still overwhelmed with, with that kind of evil. There's terrorist attacks, there's war, there's heinous beheadings, uh, all in the name of or by the people of this so-called peaceful religion. But I would caution us for a moment because I've heard Christians say, well, we're the, we're the religion of love. We wouldn't want someone to be slinging that kind of mud around us either, or about us. Meaning, if we're going to be considered the religion of love, then we should love. Love God, love your neighbor. We have to love. Number five, they control their tongues. Christians are different because they control their tongues. Uh, I wrote down here, if faith is evidenced by works then no work is going to speak louder than, for testimony than the faith that we have generated by our mouth. The things that we say. And James is saying in, in, in these passages, if you control your tongue, it's the key to controlling the rest of your body. And, you know, a person that can control their tongue, they have, they have self-control. They've, they can exercise that in other parts of their, in their life. If you don't have self-control with your mouth and the things that you say, it's a pretty good signal that you're going to have struggles in other areas, other self-control issues, if you will. You know, churches, 
what, what was that lesson that night talking about slander and gossip? I mean, very few churches break up over fundamental uh, split of some sort. It's usually something ridiculous that, that tears down the, the church family. The sixth way that a Christian's different, they consider God first in all their matters. This was our most recent lesson. Lesson, excuse me. We consider God in, in all of our matters, especially financial matters, business dealings, if you will. It doesn't matter whether we've failed or succeeded, remember, in, in any of that stuff. That's not the, uh, the deal. The, what makes us guilty or innocent in that area is if we've presented all the matters to God to begin with, you know. So James is going to finish his letter. That was our review. James is going to finish his letter with a few postscripts, uh, again, to remind us what we need to do in order to finish our Christian race. Uh, it's a journey. I think sometimes as Christians, it's very easy for us to know. I heard this, and I think it's a wonderful saying. It's very easy for us to know the destination, and we forget about the journey. We forget about the obedience and the uh, being in God's will that goes along with it. I know, I was, again, talking about this. I feel like i got to make up time with my kids. I'm like, man, some of the things I taught you weren't right. You know, and I, and I try to, and I'm sure they're just like, oh, he's preaching again, you know. But I, I'm excited about it. They need to know the difference. They need to know uh, the things that I was in error about. And, and I don't mind God humbling me and saying, look, I'm going to show you something. So James finishes his letter again with a couple postscripts in order for us to be reminded of what we need to do after we lead the letter. And that's where we're going to begin tonight's lesson. We're in chapter 5, verse 7. And we're going to talk about four PSs. And again, I remind you, PS, the postscript, PS, I love you, PS, I miss you, that kind of thing. The first one is patience. <clears throat> Let's read some scripture here. Therefore, be patient, brethren. I'm reading from the New American Standard uh, tonight. Therefore, be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. The farmer waits for the precious produce of the soil, being patient about it until it gets the early and the late rains. You too be patient. Strengthen your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is near. So the Lord's coming, and when he does, James is saying he's going to reward those that have, that have done good, those that have been faithful, you know, uh, and he's going to judge all those that have done the evil. And, and he uses a, a farmer to kind of illustrate the idea here uh, about the harvest. You know, he plants the seed. The farmer knows that there's going to be time that's going to go by before he's going to re reap any of that. So he plants, he prepares, he plants, and then he's ready. He waits. James is saying in the same way, Christians shouldn't be discouraged uh, when they notice that maybe their, their growth isn't as fast as they might want to want it to be. I know I struggle with this. Man, I'm like, I get invited to, hey, you want to come over and do this pastor thing? And I'm like, uh-huh. You know, uh, because knowing full well, they're like, you're new at this, aren't you? You know, it doesn't discourage me too bad, but I, I know that one there for sure. We shouldn't be discouraged when others are doing wrong and seem to be escaping punishment. Obviously, working on this lesson, I was having this conversation with Pastor Arlen this, this morning. Um, or about believers that are suffering, and we don't know why. Doesn't seem like there's any uh, end in sight. Sometimes it's overwhelming. You know, I think about the prayer request. I think about Sister Kay, faithfully praying up here at the altar on Sundays. Sister Linda, how many surgeries has she had? You know, to try to get her leg right. Brother Brad Braden, he's got a fight of his life going on right now. Brian Crosley. We went up there and saw him, and he's, he's praying that he gets to save his foot. You know, we, we ask ourselves, why do, why do these faithful saints suffer? And then you see other people in the world who haven't done much uh, good of, with their life or, or done anything, and, and they're just, they, they, they keep getting, like, doors open for them, and they keep getting all the things they need. And it just, you see the injustice, Pastor Arlen's word, I like that. The Lord's near and he sees us when we need help. Uh, when I say the Lord's, yes, he's near, he's coming soon one day, hopefully sooner than later, the way the world's going. But it's, here it's a practical encouragement. You know, God's here, he's present, he's aware of our difficulties. He knows what we're going through. He's, he's close at that point. Back to the be joyful in those times. 
Do not complain, brethren, against one another, so that you yourselves may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing right at the door. As an example, brethren, of suffering and patience, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. We count those blessed who endured. You have heard of the endurance of Job and have seen the outcome of the Lord's dealings, that the Lord is full of compassion and is merciful. And James is saying, hey, don't complain about each other. God's watching. You know, leave the whole judgment thing to me. Just love your brother. Let God be the judge. Just love your sister. You know, he's there. He's, he's present. He's aware of everything you're going through. Uh, and, and he knows. Just leave it to him. And then he uses Job as an example. Again, he's, he's right into the Jewish nation here, the Jewish culture. And he uses Job, you know, and he says he suffered greatly. And, and eventually God blessed him with more than he had. And, and he waited on the Lord. He waited. He remained a good man. He remained a holy man. And he waited. And, and he didn't receive his blessings just because he was good and just because he was holy. And just because he wouldn't say things against he wouldn't say things against God, and he spoke what was right. He was blessed because he was also patient. That's our first PS, patience. Our next one is purity of heart. Verse 12, But above all, my brethren, do not swear, either by heaven or by earth, or with any other oath, but your yes is to be yes, and your no, no, so that you may not fall under judgment. This is the same encouragement that Jesus was given in the Sermon on the Mount. Chapter 5, Matthew. He's saying sincerity in what you say. Let your, let your mouth match your heart. You know, I think about some, some Christians, my, myself, I, I was there. Each day I try to get better and better. We say yes to Jesus when it suits us. Uh, but we say no with our actions. It, it can be seen. Your fruit can be seen. People, you're not, you're convinced yourself that nobody can see that. But it's way more visible than you think. Christians say yes when it suits them. We say no when it gets in the middle of, uh, you know, our pastimes, our, our, our fun, um, our routines, maybe traditions, money, friends, old habits, the different pleasures that we have. We're going to jump to the book of Revelation. To the angel of the church in Laodicea, write, The Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God says this, I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot. So because you're lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. I shared last week, my sister is very much in this part of her walk in her life. She's, uh, she goes, Bob, I know what i got to do. And she's thinking she's got time. We're not guaranteed the next breath. This is straight, this, this, this scripture and revelation is from Jesus. He, the amen. He identifies himself immediately. He's the, the, God's perfect and final revelation. I thought it fitting that the, the last word in the book of Revelation, the last book in the Bible is amen. And he opens this scripture, scripture saying... I'm the amen. He's the final word in it. Truly, truly. We need to think about this. And, and why does he say, uh, I, would, I would rather you be hot or cold? I wish you were hot or cold. He's saying, I wish you were for me or against me. Something. I can do something with that. He wants to know if we can, you know, be all in. I, I, there's plenty of examples. Paul, Saul, he, he was cold-hearted, you know? He was very much against Jesus, but Jesus says to that guy, hey, I can work on him. I can change his heart. You know, somebody that's cold and says, I don't know anything about religion. I can't be convinced. I can't. Really? Jesus put, spit in some mud and put it on a guy's eyes and he could see again? I, I can't be convinced of that. I'm cold. I have no opinion. He can work with that person too. Show them things. Light a fire under their backside. But he says to a lukewarm person, he says, you, you can't do anything with that person. Yes, no Christians. He's saying they're not Christians. They, they know the talk. They know the routines. But they never really, really get hot for the Lord. 
real Christians say yes with their mouths, yes with their hearts, and yes with their actions. I can give you a tip how to get there. I've learned it. It's all this right here. Getting this Bible stuff. Getting it right in your life. I, I'm, I know I'm preaching to uh, those that are at Bible study. This isn't a, a Sunday morning message to where they're... I know you guys are faithful. I know you're in your Bibles. That's why you're here. But we should still try to be honest with ourselves about everything. Make an experiment out of it, if you will. <laughs> Tell yourselves the truth. Say what you mean, do what you say. A little self-examination is my new phrase that I like to use around the kids. Hey, time for a little self-examination time. A little self-inventory. Uh, you know, I think if you, what, you do things in, I don't know, we're funny. Sometimes we, you, you do things, you don't think about it, and all of a sudden you find yourself in, in a dishonest moment. Uh, maybe you didn't say something that could have helped somebody but then ultimately hurt you. You know, you, it's those moments I'm talking about. You can call yourself out on it. Say, hey, you know, there's, there's something you did wrong that's not right. And get help if necessary. Make an effort to hold yourself accountable. When you do that, it breaks down this facade. It puts you, you're malleable at that point. God can work with you when you get honest with yourself. When you strip away all that stuff that you keep trying to lie and convince yourself about, God can start working with that. I know. I 100% know that. The third PS. Pray. Prayer. Is anyone among you suffering? Then he must pray. Is anyone cheerful? He's to sing praises. Is anyone among you sick? Then he must call for the elders the church that they are to pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. He doesn't say, yeah, maybe you should pray. Or, you know, if you get some time, you know, you can fit it in there, pray. And he's saying you must, you must pray. You know, in, in the world when people are happy, they celebrate. Uh, they eat, they drink, they party, they have a good time. When they're sad, they cry, you know, they become depressed. They, they, they pout, nothing ever good happens to me. You know, uh, maybe some of them are stoic. They're just kind of, oh, you know, this is, this is my lot in life. Um, they don't use that word. They'd have to read the Bible, right? When they're sick, it's more the same, and, but it's usually crying because they can't go party and celebrate. Christians react differently when they're happy. Our go-to is we, we pray. We praise God. You know, we can certainly celebrate, but what I'm saying is when something good and we receive a blessing, what, what do we say? God, thank you. Thank you for the blessings in my life. Thank you for the doors that you're opening. You know, when we're sad, we pray for comfort. Um, when we're sick, we pray for help, strength, restoration, all those things. Why do Christians? Because we know. We know there's power in prayer. It's not like an inspirational poster, although it would be a good one. But it, it's, it, there's power in it. Verse 15 through 18, James gives an example of this. It says, And the prayer offered in faith will restore the one who's sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, they will be forgiven him. Therefore, confess your sins to one another. Pray for one another so that you may be healed. The effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly that it wouldn't rain. And it did not rain on the earth for three years and six months. Then he prayed again, and the sky poured rain, and the earth produced its fruit. God answers prayers and healing, Sister Kay. And every healing that he, is God's work, whether, whether men, women of, of medicine recognize it or not. God answers prayers and forgiveness of sins. With a Christian, we pray. That's how we, we go to God in prayer. For the non-Christian, well, a little, a little bit more to it. They ask for forgiveness. They accept Jesus Christ as their Savior. They repent of their sins. They show that outward change with baptism. But God answers prayers. He even does it for physical needs. And that's why James writes here, I believe, he, that's why he used Elijah as an example. He prayed earnestly for rain and, and, and received it. Billy shared this passage on, on Sunday with us. Elijah and Elisha. 
The point I'm making is to be a Christian life has to be a life of prayer. When we're happy, when we're sad, when we're sick, when we're in need, we pray. Is there something missing in your life? Pray for it. Pray about it. Paul says pray without stopping. Pray always, 1 Thessalonians. You know, Kimberly's got a cousin that uh, is married to a Muslim from Kyrgyzstan. Uh, she married, well, I don't believe she's no longer married to him now, but they were a family of Cossack riders. Uh, th- this is actually from the Caucasus Mountains, a, a traditional form of riding in, in that they would go into battle with these, with these beautiful horses. Look at the muscle and the hind haunches of that thing. And he's not just, hey, look at me, ladies, look at what I can do. No, he's ac- that's actually a move that they do to dodge an enemy sword swipe or battle axe that's coming at them. They actually slip off to the side of the horse. And then sometimes, I've, we've seen some crazy stuff. I've seen the guy go from the back of the horse between the legs while the horse is in a full-on run. Kim and I worked with him. He was a Chechen um, after the Russia broke up all those smaller countries and stuff. So they, it, was, it was a type of writing. And the reason I bring him up is because he, he was a Muslim and he, and he talked about prayer. When they would come over, oftentimes he would, he would have his carpet rolled up with him. And they almost worked for us for a little while. They came over and kind of interviewed, if you will. But he made a big deal about praying when he was with us. If he was there for any length of time, he'd, he, he had to pray five times. He had to face east. He had to find the most eastern portion of our home, go into it, take off his shoes, get down on his carpet, and, and face east. And Kim, her cousin, would always kind of come out and explain, you know, what was going on, uh, what he was doing. I knew. I, I was pretty abreast of what was going on. Uh, but he never dis- we never discussed much of the Muslim religion and, and, and him praying other than they tried to make it a spiritual moment. And, uh, you know, I know there's some that are genuine. I know that there's plenty of people in, in that whatever you call it, that are genuine and practice what they think is their religion. But there's other motivations on why they pray. It's because it's demanded that they pray. It's, it, otherwise, there's severe punishment for it. But I got to thinking, you know, they act like that's a lot of prayer. Five times a day. I'm trying to get in the habit of the first thing I do when my feet hit the floor and turn off the alarm if I have one set is to pray. When I stumble into the kitchen and grab a, a cup of coffee and, and try to read something inspirational in the morning, I try to pray. If you're a breakfast eater, you're going to pray. Maybe you get a phone call from somebody, uh, Harley, hey, Dad, I got a promotion. That's awesome, baby girl. And I, I hang up the phone. I don't get down on my knees or any of that stuff. But I'm like, thank you, God. Thank you for working in her life. We pray. And that's not even lunchtime yet. You know? Then you pray for lunch, and maybe something comes in on the prayer chain. Somebody walks in the office. I need prayer. Pastor Arlen, Pastor Rick, I don't know what to do. How many we're up to? Yeah. I pray for the Bible study. Pray for I, before I study. Lord, show me things. Teach me so I can teach others. But it's an ongoing part of our life. It's the substance of our relationship with Christ. You know, it's, a, it's, a, it's conduit. It's the channel. He, when we're talking to Him, we feel more like He's present in our life. It's absolutely necessary. And the last P.S. Pause for serious reflection. My brethren, if any among you strays from the truth and one turns him back, you know, it's possible to be saved and be in Christ and be lost. You don't get there and I've arrived, ta-da! It doesn't happen that way. You know, we can lose our way. And, and then once we lose our way, we can get stubborn and refuse to change or listen to the things that have happened. We, we don't recognize we've fallen. We become desensitized. I've, I've said this. I've heard other preachers say it. Sin doesn't, Satan's not like around the corner and all of a sudden he's like, ha, ha, and jump on you. He doesn't do that. He just kind of nips at you. Just little by little. Desensitizes you about things. We continue to add one sin after another. Instead of stopping, acknowledging, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm in error here. I'm, I'm heading down the wrong path. I need to pump the brakes. 
You know, it's kind of like us men driving around with our women. We, we uh, make the wrong turn, and then we make the next wrong turn, and then one after that, and the wife's the whole time over there going, uh, you have the, the Apple map on your phone, or the, oh, we'll find it eventually. We'll get there eventually. Same thing. We do that in life sometimes. We make a mistake. We do something stupid. You know, we, we, we lie. We get too close to temptation. All of a sudden, it's got a grip on you again. And again, instead of recognizing, hey, stop, I need to go back. I need to get back on track. Square up. We say things like, oh, I can handle it. And then it's a slippery, slippery slope after that. Quicksand. Down, 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 down. A good way to tell how far from God you are is to examine how near you are to His Word, to His will, to His people. You know, to His Word, are, you, are, are we being obedient? Are we in His will? You know, do we have that, that conscience? Are we, are we involved at church? Are we close to His people? As Christians, again, we have the destination set, but there, we know that part, but there's, there's work to do. There's a lot of freedom in Christ, but there's work to do. Let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. It's, like I said, it's, it's possible to be lost. if Nobody's read that scripture if they believe otherwise. We should be on guard to help each other find our way back. If you, know, if you find yourself in that position, here's how to help. Be gentle. Help gently. If you see your brother letting go, help him gently to return. If you neglect to do so, who's, who's going who's gonna to rescue you, you if that happens? Don't be angry or defensive if you get corrected. Don't, don't be mad. Don't go away. Don't leave the church. Don't be mad at Pastor Arlen or Pastor Ronnie, if they, they come up and tell you that there's some error, correct you or some fault. Instead, you, sh- you should be excited. You should, you should be humble and, and, and thankful that someone cared enough to, to keep you from going further into sin. Ultimately saved you from death is what they've done. Pulled you back from the ledge. So Jesus, or excuse me, James closes his letter with four PSs that are applicable again to our situation today. Persevere. The Lord is near you. Whatever the hardship, load, the discouragement that you have, don't give up. Keep on following him. Keep on obeying him. Remember, the crown of life is for those that finish. You got to finish. It's not a race. It's it's an endurance run. You got to finish it. Pure in heart. Be firm with our commitment. Let our yes be a yes. Be yes Christians, even if it costs us something. It costs Jesus everything. You know, we shouldn't complain if we have a little suffering to do in the name of the Lord. Pray. Pray for everything. Always pray. Elijah asked for it to stop raining. God answered his prayer. You know, he can help us find jobs. He can help us find a way to make ends meet. He can help us with happiness. He can help us with the solution to whatever problem we have. We have to pray in faith, and then we wait. It's what we're supposed to do. And then pause. Be careful. Uh, We could lose our way. It could happen. It's happened to others. It could happen to you. If if someone has the courage and the boldness to correct you and love you enough to to keep you, then uh, you should be grateful for that. And then I've added a fifth one. Put Put this teaching into action. Don't just hear it and understand the ideas. We've just spent nine weeks in the book of James uh, textual studying this stuff and, and, and getting into some of these ideas. We're only going to profit from it if we use it. Let's close with some scripture. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of of my Father. He who does the what? The will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. 
Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Let's not just be yes Christians. Let's be yes and do Christians. Amen? I'm going to wrap up James with that. Um, we could probably start over if you want and, and get more this time around. I'm learning that. You, you pick up different things every time. Uh, scripture speaks to you differently when you get in there. Pastor Ronnie was cleaning out his office and left a... He was taking it out, and I said, no, I'll keep it. I'll look at it. He goes, yeah, but you may not know what I'm thinking or how it was speaking to me, and it's true. There's a lot to that. There's a lot of good stuff, though. Next Wednesday, August 3rd, we have Finger Food Fellowship. Uh, we're next door, and then Pastor Arlen's going to allow me to start speaking... Uh, once a month at the big sanctuary on Sunday mornings. So I will be preaching on the 7th of August, and then following that Sunday, the 10th of August, we're going to start in the book of Galatians. Good book. All right, let's pray and be dismissed. Heavenly Father, I thank you once again for all these things that we've learned through, through the book of James. I just ask now that uh, you would help us to apply it to our lives and not just be hearers of the word, but doers of the word, Father God. I thank you for your blessings. Thank you for all these beautiful people. Bless those that are, that are hurting and suffering so much right now, Father God. Give them a special touch and anointing. Bless us now as we leave and go our separate ways. Keep us all safe until we're together again. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.